Hello and welcome to Every Anime in 1992 Reviewed Part 1, the latest installment in my series attempting to review every anime ever. An impossible goal, but I'm... I'm trying. I... I don't quite know why, but I am trying. In this video, I'm joined by my lovely guests listed here. They're all really beautiful, handsome, attractive, insanely, insanely charismatic individuals. Uh, anyways, um... <laughs> What the f*** was I saying? And we'll be taking a look primarily at anime from the winter and spring season of 92. Obviously, don't expect super in-depth analysis or anything. In fact, a lot of these are going to be a bit more like first impressions. This is really only meant to be a sort of short, well, not that short, look at the year in its entirety. And also for sequels, we'll usually be excluding them unless it's something super notable. I'm not much of one for intros though, so let's just get right into the video. I hope you enjoy. A tale of drama, romance, and fantasy, all bound up in a strange bond with the latest transfer student. The feeling of knowing someone you've never met with this tale of lives past and future. Toshiaki has lost all his memories before the age of six due to a tragic accident and feels a great longing to recover them no matter what. However, the real reason behind his missing past might be a bit more... fantastical. Sequence is a 40 minute romance mystery, and I'm holding my tongue as best I can as to spoil would kill a lot of the appeal. That mystery is the driving factor of what keeps the narrative remotely engaging as the story and characters are intriguing but not particularly compelling. That desire to understand is what sells it moment by moment. It closes conclusively, if a bit haphazardly, so not only is it overall a good time, but unlike many similar OVAs of its time, it does actually have any sort of solid resolution. A big part of the reason I genuinely enjoyed this is how it sells this tone of mystery and longing to understand from the main character in the excellent presentation. A fantastic score from Toshiyuki Watanabe, who brought Space Brothers to life with his inspiring orchestral pieces and realized by way of director Naohito Takahashi, the director behind the visually striking Berserk 97. Just Listen and look at it. The beautiful music, gorgeous backgrounds, delightful color design and shot composition, everything comes together to make it an immensely pleasing experience. It's no game changer by any means, but I'd say 40 minutes well spent. Handsome Girl is a one-episode OVA from J.C. Staff, directed by Shunji Oga, based on the manga of the same name by Wataru Yoshizumi. It is not very good. Handsome Girl is about an actress who is also a high schooler named Mio Hagiwara, who is very suddenly cast in a movie she didn't even audition for, falls in love with the director who is an asshole, and, uh, nothing else. That's it. That's the whole deal. This OVA, clocking in at just under 37 minutes, has very little of substance going on, and I'm not keen to blame the runtime on that. Every episode of every anime you've ever watched usually accomplishes more with less. This OVA just wastes a lot of the time it was allotted, and even the time it does dedicate to its characters and story isn't effectively utilized. As to the time it wastes, there's like four or five musical montages that skim past a bunch of story and presumably character beats in favor of playing what were at the time, I assume, topical pop songs, but no matter what time period you're examining, this from the musical interludes don't do anything for the pacing of the affair, and even when the OVA's not in music mode, it's not doing much better for itself. The character work is distinctly lacking, which is kind of a big problem when the main thrust of the narrative is supposed to be a romance. The lead, Mio, has absolutely no personality whatsoever. 
which is just insulting to the good name of Mio. She is totally passive, has no agency at all. She just goes with the flow and makes no decisions for herself, making her wholly alienating as a protagonist. And then her love interest does nothing but act like an ass to her, so the two have absolutely no reason to fall in love, no chemistry or anything, and yet, I guess the plot dictates that in love they must be, so in love they do fall. <sighs> and then there's the dropped love triangle plotline, where a mutual acquaintance of the couple, an idol named... something I'm sure, used to be in a relationship with Mr. Ass, and she still loves him, and and that's it. We never get any follow-up or resolution to that plotline. The closest thing this OVA has to a theme or idea, as noted by the title, is not actually present in any meaningful capacity. Just look at that title, Handsome Girl. Doesn't that get your head spinning? Don't we usually call men handsome and women beautiful? What would it mean then to call a woman handsome? As someone who has occasionally opened an old book, I can tell you that describing a woman as handsome is nothing new, but in our modern cultural context, what new meaning has that word taken on? And by applying that modern definition outside of our modern gender norms, what are we saying about our own perceptions of the roles inhabited by both genders, the malleability and performativity of it all, and how it's ultimately up to the individual to define oneself, whether they're self definition falls within or outside of their assigned gender. Congratulations, you just put a whole lot more thought into the title than this OVA did. How that comes up in this 30-odd excruciating minutes is that the love interest dude tells Mio, hey, I think you're handsome, and isn't it weird that I said that? And then the whole idea is dropped entirely. Fucking... Uh, granted, the manga this OVA is based on is nine volumes long. It's entirely possible that this OVA rushed through as much of the source material as it could as an advertisement or bonus for fans or what have you. But whatever it was trying to do, let me tell you, it did the manga no favors. It has precisely two cuts of animation that I thought were kind of neat, and I guess the 90s shoujo aesthetic is pleasing, but otherwise, it wholly failed at selling the manga as a worthwhile read. I actively do not want to read the source material despite initially planning to, and that's about a big an indictment as I can serve. Skip this one. Wait, he doesn't enter the mech, he IS the mech! Tekum and Blade follows the humans' war against the Radom, an alien species that's power is far beyond anything they can fight against. However, in the face of despair, there is one seeming hope remaining, a mysterious man who crashes down to Earth after fighting in space. And we find that inside him is a secret weapon, the ability to transform into a robot that can actually deal some damage. The catch is, he's been hit with a bad case of amnesia, and all he can remember is that he must defeat the Radom. So the many questions about why these aliens are attacking, how to defeat them, and what exactly he is, remain unanswered. I mean, it's not exactly common for humans to turn into giant space robots. This begins a begrudging collaboration with the Space Knights, the human crew stumbled upon him. There's a clear sense of mystery and things not being told as interpersonal conflicts and space fights unfold, but ultimately, after six episodes things started to get old, one too many eyes rolled, and to boredom I was being lulled, so uh, I dropped it. They keep calling him D-Boy, which just sounds fucking stupid. D-Boy! D-Boy! The visual direction is weirdly disjointed, there's no sense of rhythm to it. Every episode I watched was kinda just, we can't trust him, but let's trust him, okay, fine, on repeat ad infinitum, and all the characters act incredibly stupid. It's really repetitive and honestly not good looking enough for me to put up with it. Psst, it's also a remake of a show from the 70s, I just couldn't really figure out where to fit that in. The term dumb fun has a lot of strange connotations about it, and it's not a term I like to throw around a lot. But that phrase is 
pretty much the perfect way to describe KO Century Beast Warriors. In a world where the southern hemisphere of the Earth has disappeared, tribes of beast people fight against human oppressors led by an evil being named Uranus, and their desire for freedom leads them on a quest to find Gaia, an unknown treasure that could help them save the world. To accomplish that, the trio must escort the daughter of a human scientist who may have a way to discover Gaia's location, and they are granted control over three giant robots to aid them in battle. Might sound a bit overblown and complicated on the surface, but the plot is mostly just used as a vehicle for fun, episodic stories that only gain a heavy narrative focus in the second half. There's a really strong balance between the comedic and serious elements, which is why I'm often averse to using the term dumb fun because it kinda implies that the plot doesn't really matter, whereas in this instance it's much more like the plot matters, but the scenario is so insane that trying to take it too seriously would be a mistake, so we're just gonna have a fun time and see what happens. And the focus on clever dialogue and comedic timing hooked me almost immediately. The characters have pretty standard personality, loud guy, pretty boy, and girl, but the chemistry they have together makes each interaction insanely hilarious and just a ton of fun to watch. There's this duo of villains that feel like Jesse and James from Team Rocket. The pretty boy constantly uses English and apparently his tribe is based in the US or something. This pixie thing is adorably evil and annoying but in a good way. It's a hell of a fun romp. Even when the plot does get more cohesive, and serious near the end, it feels focused enough and the comedy is strong enough to keep the serious bits from feeling out of place. And it has some genuinely interesting ideas about humanity's place in the natural world. The show's episodic nature bleeds into the production end as well. This is definitely one of those shows where you can feel the distinct voices of the directors and animators behind each episode. Episode 1 is hyperactive and explosive, 4 feels more bouncy and experimental, 3 directors by Tatsuya Ishihara, by the way, has more extreme color work and storyboarding. It feels a little bit like the second season of Space Dandy with how different each episode feels. Granted, this doesn't work out all the time. Episode 2 was just kind of flat and boring, but on the whole, it's good much more often than bad. I love the uber 90s aesthetic it has with the character designs, and the color work is usually very strong and vibrant. The animation can be pretty great as as well, especially with some of the character acting in episode 4. And of course, Gainax always has the best explosions, so we get to see some of that here. Unfortunately, it does have a notable consistency problem, especially in the beginning. Sometimes it looks good, and sometimes I can see the cells shaking when they're not supposed to be. It definitely gets a bit distracting at times, but rarely enough for me to actively dislike it. This show is dumb fun to its core, but it's dumb fun with a lot of care and effort put into how that dumb fun is presented. And while it occasionally misses the mark, there's more than enough good for me to say I had a genuinely fun time. There's a clear distinction. Heck, I would even say it is the most fundamental, the true deepest element that distinguishes two types of humans. One might even say it is the true reason behind all conflict, all war, crime, and unrest across human history. That essential divide, unknowable line, the truly most grand of differences is whether or not you like gross out humor. Look, I like cute things, I like dark things, fuck, I like weird things quite a bit, but shit that's outright gross, particularly that which is purely for the sake of comedy, not aiming to, like, unsettle you or anything, is something that I simply will never enjoy. So here's Chameleon, which opens with two hoodlums pissing on a poor sap and a dude talking through his shits. The base premise is built around Eisaku Yazawa, a pompadour sporting shorty who plays the tough guy but really is Yoai. I mean weak, I just wanted the alliteration, okay? It's a classic tale of a guy that lucks his way into a high status, continually being mistaken as more and more notorious, and getting beat plenty of times along the way. If rude humor fits your taste, then it might be worth a look, though there's only two episodes currently translated out of the six episode OVA. I'm certainly no connoisseur of that spectrum, but personally it's just too fucking ugly and the characters are rather unlikable. 
Also, the entire gag for the second half of the first episode is the MC being led on by a guy presenting as female. But then at the reveal, when Isaku is shocked and disinterested, they become really rapey, aggressive, and violent, and they aren't explicitly said to be trans, but it's kind of like, uh, not, not a fan. I just don't, yeah, I think I'm fine never looking at the show again. I need some Maho Shoujo to wash my eyes out. So, there's this thing called the bader meinhof phenomenon, and if you don't know it already, you might just start hearing about it soon. Also known as the frequency illusion, it's that eerie feeling you get when you begin encountering something you had just heard about, seemingly everywhere. Say you just learned that nickels are mostly copper, and then the next day a cashier mentions it to you as well, or you notice a video about it in your recommendations. However, the actual frequency of events related to that thing hasn't increased, you're just able to notice it more. While I was sitting down to watch Candy Candy for this project, it was a little while after I had started listening to a new podcast, The Happiness Lab by Dr. Lori Santos. It's an adaptation of her infamous Yale course that got instant attention from people seeking happiness, and the science behind it. And maybe it was Bader Meinhof for simply Candy's shining optimism, but I couldn't help but see the same concept reflected through this sweet little movie. To clarify, this version of Candy Candy that aired in 1992, my birth year, is a recap movie for the TV series that ran 115 episodes from 1976 to 1979. Obviously, it's quite an ordeal to cram that much content into such a short runtime of 40 minutes, but I think it does a decent job at emphasizing its strengths. And one of the biggest of those is Candy. Candy is almost the epitome of every single girl down on her luck trope that exists. The movie starts with her being abandoned at an orphanage as a baby, and then, while at that orphanage, being passed up on until she's too old for anyone to want her, she eventually finds a family willing to take her in. As a servant. From there, we go into evil stuck-up step siblings that torment her every waking second, when she's simply trying to survive. It's like Cinderella all over again. However, unlike Cinderella, Candy has no magic fairy godmother or cute animals to help her. Nevertheless, she is able to help herself just fine. Despite all of the unfortunate situations Candy finds herself in, she somehow keeps the faith and the universe rewards her for her kindness. The Happiness Lab goes into a new way scientists have discovered to achieve happiness each episode, and it somehow seems Candy was decades ahead of the curve. While she may feel sad and disappointed from time to time, she never takes out her frustrations or disparages others. Instead, she continually expresses gratitude for the meager boons she is given. Yes, she might have been adopted into just a horrible family that features Discount Team Rocket, but they also give her shelter and education. Plus, she's befriended all the wonderful workers who feel for her situation. And despite just how terrible she gets treated, from being bullied to having meals denied, she rarely holds a grudge. Even when she faces bitter betrayal, she only ever wishes for the utmost happiness and well-being of others. You could almost say she's... sweet? Okay, okay, enough with the puns. In response to Candy's unrelenting positivity, others outside of her inner circle who aren't horrible human beings immediately notice and want a slice of the nicest pie. They do their best to do everything possible to make her happy, because at the end of the day, they know she deserves it. The figurehead at the top of all this is the stereotypical prince, here to sweep her away and give her everything she's ever wanted, which really is just kindness in return. All in all, Candy Candy is a relatively by-the-book story about how a nice girl overcomes evil step-siblings to win her prince, and how the power of positivity can shine through darkness if you let it. To some, it may be too tropey, idealistic, and saccharine, but what did you expect from something called Candy Candy? For me, it was a nice treat in the middle of some hard times, and there's a hundred more episodes for those who like its brand of wholesomeness. I love food. I mean, who doesn't? It's genuinely a big part of what makes life worth living. 
When it comes to the content I consume, aside from anime and manga, the majority of what I'm watching at any given time is YouTube, and in particular a big portion of that is food-related content. There's simply something endlessly entertaining about watching people make and talk about food. It's so varied and gives a great ground on which for charismatic personalities to work their magic. There's a deep emotional connection between food and the bonds we share, mealtime often associated with family and friends, and media that exemplifies that in particular can hit a specific but but excellent emotional note. Cooking Papa follows exactly what its title describes, a salaryman and father of one with an extremely busy journalist wife. This Cooking Papa cooks all the food for the household, though keeps it on the down low out of, well, embarrassment, I guess. Especially considering the time period, taking that role is a bit unconventional for his gender. He's the kind of guy to always look out for you and help anyone in a time of need, but never want acknowledgement for it. Appearances might lead you to think he's stern and cold, but Kazuma Raiwa's the biggest softie there is. I just, I just want to give him a big old hug. The anime unfortunately only has a single translated episode out of over a hundred, serving to introduce the characters and following Makoto, Kazuma's son, as he befriends a lonely girl shortly before she must leave town, and as a final act of friendship, cooks a parting gift for her with the help of his dad. It's sappy, but it works, even if the animation is a bit stiff, and even teaches you how to make what they made that episode at the very end. From what I can find, it seems the manga is incredibly popular in Japan, considering it started in 1985 and is still running, now with over 150 volumes. From the few fan-translated chapters i found, it seems each installment is a fairly self-contained experience, though everything does progress linearly in time, showing a little chapter in this family's life and highlighting a different recipe with a short instructional panel on how to do it yourself. The manga is even better than what I saw of the anime, the line work and paneling is incredibly expressive, I love every character and how they play off of each other, the drunken over-the-top journalist wife in particular is my favorite. It's impressively charming and pulls a lot out of its fairly simple premise while doing a good job of executing what seems to be the goal, making cooking more accessible. Hopefully it gets an official translation as I could genuinely see this doing well. I think pretty much anyone will have a good time with Cooking Papa, unless you, I don't know, hate food or something. <laughs> Or if you aren't familiar with the complex language of Nihongonese, Ren Melos is the historical anime film based off of a short story written by Osamu Dazai. Osamu Dazai, if you know not, is considered one of the greats in Japanese literature and quite possibly the greatest of the 20th century. You may know him from his other works like The Setting Sun and No Longer Human, stories so terribly depressing the latter basically being an extensive suicide note. Oddly enough, Hashire Merosu is quite the opposite from Dazai being a much more light-hearted story that is widely read as a classical book in Japanese schools, taking place in Syracuse in the 300s BC. Yeah, baby. BC! It tells the story of a good-hearted man named Melos who got into some shit and ends up being put on trial to die. He makes a deal with some other character and has three days to get back home to his village for his sister's marriage and back to the town so he can die or someone else will die in his place. It's a marathon story about trust and bros and shit. Unbelievably straightforward, but that really isn't a bad thing. I guess the best way to describe this anime would be that it does not feel like an anime. It feels like an animated movie, yes, but has no Japanese connection to it at all aside from the characters speaking Japanese. If you're a fan of historical movies, you will most likely enjoy this. It is technically well made. And I did do what could basically be considered the most minimum amount of research I could have possibly done. And yes, it does look to be pretty historically accurate to the time period at the end of the movie actually in the credits it actually relates the ruins of the society to their real life counterparts i enjoyed it it was passable probably just enough to give it a 6 out of 10 boy oh boy oh boy do i love me some first world problems and this anime certainly has them in hearty supply Following the young Shun Godai as he must resist the pressures of his CEO grandfather to follow in his footsteps and become successful, he instead must pursue his dream of soccer. Or 
football. Apparently the whole show was dubbed in Spanish, French, and Italian, though not English, which is not particularly surprising if you consider how much more popular soccer is in those countries compared to in America. But when I called it First World Problems, I do mean that. At least from the show's introduction, we see a bunch of elite kids living the high life at a high class private school, and it's pretty difficult to empathize with the main character's struggle when it seems like such a non-issue. They might do more with it later, as I can't find out past the singular subbed introductory episode, but that pressure of responsibility seems pretty light from my perspective. Not that if a character is rich I can't empathize, but it requires a sense of genuine struggle and conflict. The characters, the setting, everything is just kinda nothing. And I wouldn't mind a chill vibe, but it's not even that exactly. The music, however, does set a fantastic tone. Composed by Osomo Totsuka, who is behind the music for Yoroden Samurai Troopers or Ronin Warriors, the whole thing feels like a fucking city pop album is playing in the background, which would be great, but as you can probably see, this show isn't exactly much of a looker. And anyways, the aesthetics of opulence, especially of this kind, don't really appeal to me much. I'm more about that grungy shit, so I'll have to pass on this one. Yugo Sako, the director and the producer of this film, got interested in the story of Ramayan while working on an excavation documentary named The Ramayan Relic. He liked the story so much that he researched it deeply and read about 10 different variants of Ramayan in Japanese. So he wanted to adapt it into an anime because he thought that a live adaptation wouldn't do justice to the story of a god. So, like a true artist, Yugo Sako went on and came to India to learn more about the Ramayana. He went to meet different saints and historians, scholars and archaeologists. The news of a Japanese man coming to India to make an animation film about one of the biggest religious aspects of Hindu culture. And the documentary of Yugo Sako's The Ramayana Relics was misinterpreted by the Indian news channels and they thought that he was making a new, his own version of Ramayan. Soon after that, Vishwa Hindu Parishad sent a letter to the Japanese embassy protesting the film that Yugo Sako was trying to make, Ramayan The Legend of Prince Ram, because they believed that arbitrary cinematization of Ramayan would be a great disrespect because it is a very big heritage. Well, definitely Yugo Sako wasn't making his own version of Ramayan. So once that misconception was cleared, Yugo Sako was given the go. So as you know, we can't have good things. So the Indian government shoved their foot into the project and said, this will be a bi-nation collaboration, saying that Ramayan is a very sensitive subject and cannot be portrayed as a cartoon. So the movie was ultimately produced in Japan with around 450 artists from both nations. Now let's talk about my views on the film itself. This was actually a big part of uh, my childhood because I remember a lot of scenes from the film and I remember a lot of songs from it. Sita in Panchivati is a song from my childhood that I remember because I have heard it in different locations, in different temples, different places, in different states and even in festivals. So I think it is actually pretty cool that an anime had impact in my childhood even before I knew what anime was and much cooler thing is that it actually had an impact on the culture of India. This was actually made out of respect for Ramayan, so I think Yugo Sako would be really really delighted that his work has become part of the culture. Now moving on from the influence of the film and the backstory, let's talk about the film itself. Now as a film, it definitely has a lot of weaknesses. First of all, you're trying to adapt a 850 page novel into 2 hours. That is ridiculous. There are a lot of things that have been just shafted aside like the training at the start, they off screened Wally, they also just skipped over waking up Kumkaran, which in different animations which were made in India had some really interesting quips to them. So it is pretty ridiculous that they tried to fit that much into two hours. Now remember, it is adapting 850 pages, they definitely had to cut stuff, which came to the part of Hanuman remembering how to fly. Now you would have expected this being a bi-national production to it be accurate to the source. But no 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 no. There were quite a bit of inaccuracies like Lakshman making the Lakshman Rekha with rice grains. Second example, just a little before they entered Lanka itself, 
Ram meditated to the god of the ocean for seven days. And after seven days, it is shown in the movie that the ocean lord came and was like, yeah, just write some name here on the stone and just throw them there and yeah, you can just go there. No, that did not happen. What actually happened is much more interesting, which is Ram actually pulled out his bow and he was really busy. He was like, man, I've been doing it for seven days. Let me pass or I will just dry up this ocean myself by shooting this bow into it. Because his bow is imbued with power too. Come on. So... Ocean Lord was like, oh shit, I need to come out. He's like, um, please don't. Lord Ram was like, man, I've already pulled my bow. I need to shoot it somewhere. I can't just put it down. It would be a dishonor for a warrior like me. So he told him to shoot it to a mountain, which comes to be handy for Lakshman. So this cherry booty in the story, which comes around later, actually came about because of the arrow Ram shot. So they basically rat gone Ramayan here even after being a bi-national story because of pacing issues. Now, this is really stupid that they actually write Khan Ramayan because that was the whole aim of it being a bi-national adaptation. So in the end, I think this film as a film is pretty not good because of the pacing. I do wish that one day we will get a good, more faithful and accurate anime adaptation of Hindu mythology because boy, like Hindu mythology is pretty shonen. So if you've got an anime adaptation, it would be actually really great. Hey everyone, I just wanted to let you know that I am now opening up applications for me to be your boyfriend. Here, let me show you my resume. I've got a lot of good points I'm pretty proud of. I'm tall, I have an incredibly long face, um, I'm, I'm really good at basketball. But with that said, I do have a couple bad points. Bare, barely worth thinking about, barely, barely even worth considering. They're, they're nothing, they're tiny, minute. I'm ugly, I'm an asshole, I'm boring, I'm lame, I receive endless aid but never show any appreciation for it, I'm uncomfortably raping on multiple occasions. Actually, you know what, let's just stop there. They're mere trifles anyways. Boyfriend is boring, showing us the tale of Mr. I forgot his name 10 seconds after finishing this OVA, as this delinquent learns to grow through the frail girl that cares deeply for him and the stern but knowledgeable guiding figure of the new coach. It's a pretty common formula and executed with basically nothing of interest. As an adaptation of a work by shoujo mangaka Fuyumi Soju, regardless of preferences and style, it fails entirely at the difficult job of capturing that detailed shoujo aesthetic. Visually unappealing and largely static, though when it does move you'll wish it didn't. Aside from the weirdly thorough lack of background music making the experience all the more painfully sluggish, the greatest issue lies in the main character, who is ultimately entirely unlikable, acting an ass to all those who show care without ever providing much reason to want him to succeed or turn a new lead. The rapey moments in particular exemplify this issue, and while that's no uncommon trait in this kind of shoujo story, and I understand the appeal of that kind of dynamic even if I rarely can get into it myself, the problem is the main character is just not cool. It's not hot to get dommed by a lame-ass motherfucker, and that sucks out even the tiniest fragment of appeal it could have had for me. At least it has a nice ED though, that's honestly the only thing I can really give it. Hmm. Man, why why aren't the applications rolling in? That's so strange. I'm I'm a fucking catch, man. I'm a catch. Is basketball just not cool anymore or something? What could it what could it possibly be? Oh, I know. I just need a longer face. Traversing the world of OVAs can be interesting to say the least, especially when the OVAs in question are adaptations rather than original works, such as the case with Sazan Eyes. Our protagonist, Yakimo, starts off as your average dude who has a fateful encounter with a girl named Pi, who turns out to be a 300-year-old demon who's trying to become human. It also turns out that Pi has a split personality, one childish and infantile, and the other, referred to as Sanjian, more akin to the 300-year-old demon she actually is. And after Yakumo is killed and resurrected as one of Sanjian's servants, he is forced to aid Pai in her quest and confront his relationship with both sides of her personality. If you're looking for something that even remotely resembles a complete story, you're definitely not gonna find one here. This OVA adapts the first 17 chapters of what eventually became a 577-chapter manga, 
manga. So this is basically just the prologue to a much larger work, and not a very substantial one at that. While I haven't read the manga myself, the anime gives off this ever-present feeling of having left out several details from the story at large in order to condense this prologue enough to fit into four episodes, and the story and characters suffer as a result. Characterization in particular was lacking quite a bit, with not much more than a few basic traits to keep the characters moving forward, so most of them felt fairly hollow and uninteresting by the end. There's also a romance subplot between Pi and Yakumo that kinda comes out of nowhere near the end and rushes towards a conclusion that totally threw me through a loop. Aside from the standard hot girl make guy go on adventure trope, there was no indication of any romantic interest between these two, so it just ended up feeling forced and contrived. Still, there are some elements that I at least appreciated, in particular how it navigates some of anime's more frustrating cliches. Instead of Yakumo trying to keep his powers hidden from others resulting in bad comedy, he just comes right out and says it. Pai tries to sneak into Yakumo's school because she wants to be a student, which made me cringe in anticipation, but the story sidesteps this entirely in favor of something more interesting. It's refreshing to not see it repeat the same cliches we've seen a thousand times. In terms of animation, uh, let's put it this way. I watched the first few minutes and then searched for a different torrent batch because I thought the files were just fucked up. This anime is not a pretty sight to behold. Occasionally it has a few decent cuts and the last episode finally decides to do some more interesting lighting work, but on the whole it's just super mediocre. And most of the fight scenes are pretty lackluster and don't get quite as intense as I had hoped. That being said, episode 2 absolutely delivers on this and is easily the most memorable fight of the series. Voice acting was kinda average all around, Megami Hayashibara's stern and deeper portrayal of Sanjian was strong and exactly what I'd expect from her, but the squeakier and more childlike tone for Pi became rather grating after a while despite how well it matches Pi's personality. Akio Otsuka shows up in the last episode and does his usual tough guy voice, but isn't nearly as impressive as some of his more recent roles. On the other hand, Kaoru Wada's soundtrack is pretty much the only part of this show I unquestionably enjoyed. The fully orchestrated score, occasionally flavored with an eastern aesthetic, makes each moment feel powerful and impacting, often carrying entire scenes when other elements fail. I'd be lying if I said this OVA was just a lot of missed potential, since there's not a lot going for it in the first place, but even then it falls several rungs short of what I was hoping for and left me utterly disappointed. Unless you've completely run out of other 80s and 90s OVAs to binge, I'd recommend avoiding this one. The clock just barely strikes 6am as the sun rises on a fresh weekend, and you eagerly jump out of bed, still buzzing with energy from your excitement the night prior, just barely able to fall asleep in spite of your impatient mind. You race downstairs, turn on the TV, pour yourself a bowl of your favorite name brand cereal, and thus begins the highlight of your 8 year old life. Saturday morning cartoons. Action, drama, comedy, it has everything you could ever want. An exciting escape and embrace of lofty dreams and aspirations. That delightful slice of so many people's childhoods captures a specific brand of nostalgia, and media that taps into that has a kind of irresistible charm to me. Densetsu no Yusha Dagarn embodies this perfectly. While not among my particular roster of childhood media, it still has a lot of the style and attitude that resonates through them all. Which makes a lot of sense as this is the third entry in the Brave series, a toy show tie-in that was produced as a follow-up to Transformers after its decline in popularity in Japan. Dagarn follows a young Seiji Takasugi as he is granted control of the Brave Fighters, a squad of mechas eons old born from the Earth itself for the sake of its protection. With, of course, the guidance of a 10 year old. I mean, that's only logical. And protect it he must against the invading Lord Obos. Yes, that is his actual name. The plot is a pretty simple good versus evil, and the visuals aren't anything especially exciting, but there's a level of nuance and personality to the character writing that makes the show a really enjoyable time. There's the fun childhood friend dynamic with the adorable Hikaru, a type of back and forth I pretty much always love, 
There's a bit of playful jabbing, but it all comes from a great sense of care. Perhaps it's because I long for that kind of caring to make up for my own sense of inadequacy. Actually, you know what? Let's not psychoanalyze here. It has a great sense of humor, consistently getting a chuckle out of me with its goofy cast, from Hikaru's ditzy lovey-dovey parents, to the tempestuous baddie obsessed with beauty and the hilariously incompetent police officer that owns the car Dagarn inhabits. Which is how all the robots work, inhabiting real vehicles and transforming when the time calls. I just love the absurdity of him standing there talking to a car, especially when his family and friends start thinking he's going fucking insane when they catch him doing it. This show just feels real comfy. The light color palette, episodic conflict, lightly comedic dialogue, and all still with some moments of more genuine emotional catharsis to it. It's goofy and cheesy, but still bubbling with heart, a far more enjoyable time than I would have ever expected from my surface level impressions. Joker Marginal City is a story written by a retarded 6th grader for his English class. Yup. Make it simple and say it's a story about fucking nothing, but Cora is specifically wanting me to give it a fair review, and a fair review I shall give it. I'm gonna be honest, I knew exactly what the fuck I was getting into when I realized it was starting off with a long, out of context action scene, but the movie features a few forgettable characters and characters that seem to randomly be forgotten by the story's writer itself. It's a serial killer detective story in the first five minutes, a taboo love story the next ten minutes, and a cliche sci fi flick for the last twenty minutes with absolutely no cohesion in between anything that transpires. Some bullshit will happen for a couple minutes, then they'll pants up random city shots. Some more bullshit will happen for a couple minutes, then they'll pants up random city shots. Nothing is explained, things are constantly being brought up and you just kinda have to accept it for what it is, which I personally hate doing, especially while watching an anime that wants me to take it seriously. Intersex aliens, secret associations, shape-shifting humans, super spooky mysterious doctor man, serial killer on the loose. This movie's a goddamn train wreck in every way imaginable. You should not watch this. You will not watch this. 2 out of 10, baby. Oyoyubi Hime Monogatari, or Thumbelina A Magical Story, is an anime you can watch. But only kind of. A 26 episode series, its English release was a dubbed 80 minute cut of the movie released on DVD. However, despite not being able to find any reference to it anywhere I looked, there has to have been a fully dubbed English version, which they just used to cut into the movie that was never released, because I was able to find a 4 hour cut together of the dubbed anime on YouTube that ends abruptly, as well as a 2 hour 30 minute cut on archive.org that also ends abruptly. Kind of odd that I can't find any information about a full dub, but it definitely is the same dub as the movie, so it must have aired somewhere. Outside of English, though, the anime is fully dubbed in several other languages. I even found someone in the process of subtitling the Spanish dub into English, so it does seem there's a fair bit of fondness for the series in countries outside of Japan and America. Hurry up, come on, we've really gotta get going now! What the fuck was that transition? The movie itself is pretty obviously cut together considering how quickly it moves, but essentially it shows the journey of Mia, a bratty young girl that is apparently so bad that her mom has to go to a witch for advice on how to get her to be good. The witch tells her to get her to read the story of Thumbelina, and on doing so she is sucked into the story, and along the way learns to be a good girl. The weird part is that, at least in the movie, she's not even that bad. I guess a bit hyperactive, but not exactly the total piece of shit you would expect would be required for trying to emotionally traumatize this young child into conforming. But hey, emotionally traumatizing young children is pretty epic, so I guess I'm here for it. Not for this movie, though. The movie kinda sucks. Dai Sogen no Chisana Tenshi, 
Bush Baby, or Little Angel of the Great Plains Bush Baby, or simply The Bush Baby, is a world masterpiece theater show from Nippon Animation and director Takayoshi Suzuki, adapted from the 1965 children's novel The Bush Babies by William Stevenson. And it is, thankfully, perfectly watchable. The Bush Baby is about a British girl named Jackie Rhodes. She's living with her family in Kenya in the middle of the 20th century just as Kenya is establishing its independence from Britain and all the local English folk are peacing out. Jackie's father works on a wildlife preserve protecting animals from poachers when he one day stumbles upon a sick, orphaned, baby Bush Baby and decides, I'm taking this with me. Jackie latches onto it, nurses it back to health, names it Murphy, and he becomes her inseparable companion through the many adventures that follow, which include, but are not limited to, escaping from dangerous poachers, having a pleasant trek up the mountain with the fam, encountering deadly wildlife like this giant fucking crocodile, and more. Given this series' 40-episode run, there's a whole lot I could dive into that I don't have near enough time for. There's the fact that Murphy is absolutely the cutest motherfucker. He engages in a lot of fun hijinks and is the primary source of the show's bits of lively animation and humor. Plus, he made me aware of the existence of real bush babies, which are actually adorable. There's the show's ability to build a strong connection between Jackie and Murphy, so you really feel for her when she starts struggling with the decision to let him go. In general, Jackie's a very compelling protagonist. She rarely has much narrative agency, but she's strong-willed and adventurous. She sees the world with a childish glee that can't help but rub off on you. There's the scope of the adventure and the show's pacing, with the first 20 episodes mixing in slice-of-life fun times with the planting of narrative seeds that sprout suddenly around the halfway mark when the show shifts gear into full-on adventure through the wilderness mode. There's this one side character named Mickey who's enough of an asswipe that you can't help but wonder why anyone bothers keeping him around. And then there's the show's, uh, whiteness. Weird thing to say about a Japanese cartoon, I know, but remember, the original story was written by a white man, apparently from his personal experience, which I guess explains how, for a story set in an African nation with a minuscule European population during a time of profound political upheaval that acts as the backdrop and driving force for some of the narrative, the majority of the cast ended up being white. <laughs> Look, I'm, I'm not casting shade on the Japanese production here. I'm just saying that the source material is just the tiniest bit suspect. All of that adds up to a show that is just fine. It's watchable. It'll do. But none of that is what's most interesting about The Bush Baby. What's most interesting about it is its English availability. See, up until relatively recently, if you couldn't speak Japanese, you couldn't watch the show. At least, not if you wanted to understand it. Only the first episode has been subtitled, so your only other option was to be alive during the late 90s in Canada. TV Ontario produced and aired an English-dubbed version of the show, but after it aired, that dub disappeared. It never had any home media release, and when asked about it years later, a representative from TV Ontario apparently denied that they had ever aired the show, which... <laughs> that's some conspiracy bait right there. But anyway, for the longest time, the dub was considered a lost piece of anime history, until a Canadian mom and her kid saved the day. If you go on YouTube right now, you'll find that the entire English dub has been uploaded by a user named Azunyan, and can I say, that's a choice username right there. From what they wrote in the descriptions of these uploads, Azunyan loved this show as a kid, so much so that their mother went the extra mile and recorded the whole thing on VHS, even going so far as to wait almost a year to record reruns of episodes they missed. And they kept those VHS tapes for all those years, and thanks to them the entire show is now available to view for any English speaker who wants to. So hats off to you lot. Azunyan and your mother, you seized the means of anime distribution, comrades. Bless you. So while overall this show is just fine, I have to appreciate it as a weird bit of anime history with regard to dubs and preservation. If you asked me whether you should watch this show just on its own merits, I'd shrug and say, eh, if you've really got nothing else to do, then go for it, I guess. But if you're curious about a weird piece of anime history and asked me whether this was worth checking out, then, uh... Yeah, do go for it. Apollo.
A new entrance comes to the world of sumo, Hari Manata entering the stage. His gaudy debut has him enter the stage sporting an oni mask, removing it to declare the following. Futabayami Sadaji, a sumo legend, had a run of 69 consecutive wins. Hari Manata says he'll beat that run, and if not, he'll retire forever. <laughs> So, basically the premise has established that our main character can never lose. From the few episodes I watched, the focus seems to be more on how everyone reacts to Hari Manada rather than the man himself. However, that ultimately leaves the main thrust of the show rather lacking in much reason for emotional investment. And there's pretty much no setup before it jumps right into the action. For me, it was rather difficult to get remotely invested in the matches as someone with little interest and no knowledge of sumo. And even if you had both, I imagine it probably wouldn't be the most compelling either. Honestly, just watching a couple of Futabayami Sadaji's matches on YouTube, who was actually a real person, was way more entertaining. Especially since most of them are only like one or two minutes. Look at that. I mean, that's that's pretty neat. Better than the uh, better than the anime. Oh boy, do I like Chinese dresses. Oh, what? Sorry, I got distracted. Spirit of Wonder, Miss China's Ring, opens up with a storyteller regaling the viewer with an amusing story by the fire. And it continues this sort of atmosphere throughout the entirety of the OVA. It really feels as if you're being made privy to an event, the specifics of which are only known to a select few that you're now a part of. It focuses on the eponymous Miss China, a rambunctious young girl who just happens to own her own tavern as well as her eccentric inventor tenant who's always behind on his rent. I really wasn't sure what to expect coming into this OVA. The opening scene kind of reminded me of a sort of card captor ish discovery of an artifact, and the title sort of leans that way as well. But as I continued watching, there's one moment where things are made obvious, and I don't know why I didn't expect it earlier. It's a sci-fi love story. A very strange sci-fi love story at that. The reason I should have known is because a large part of the story is reflected around the moon. The moon itself has always been a sort of romance icon, with many a dreamy night being blanketed by moonlight. Japan itself has an interesting relationship with the moon as well. In mythology, Tsukuyomi stands beside Amaterasu, defined by order and beauty, and spends his time endlessly chasing her across the sky. And of course, many are aware of Sosuke Natsume's infamous translation of I love you into Tsuki ga kirei desu ne? Or, the moon is beautiful tonight, isn't it? Just as that last line is built upon the premise that subtext is more than enough to convey the meaning, Spirit of Wonder also tries its best to mirror that philosophy. It still fails the age-old adage of show don't tell from time to time, but for the most part it really allows the audience to pick up on small clues and infer things for themselves. This is mostly accomplished through some interesting storyboarding that allows the primary emotion of the scene to shine through. That, combined with the color palette and animation, lends itself to a lot of pretty, wistful, and contemplative scenes tinged with a bit of melancholy. Now, the thing is, despite it being sort of a heartwarming journey of a fierce, independent woman getting into a relationship, the story is also... bonkers. You've got this girl, who just randomly owns an entire business starting from the age of 18, and she's being courted by the assistant to this bum who's also a scientist who never has money to pay his rent, the reason he doesn't have money to pay his rent is because he's spending it all to make an invention to manipulate any object in view, and yet somehow is unable to sell this invention. And then the assistant is like, wait, I know how to win her heart, I'll desecrate the moon! Everyone pretends not to notice that the moon has a weird random birthday message on it, so the assistant decides that writing isn't enough, and what he's gonna do is literally destroy it and scatter its fragments around the earth, essentially making the Halo games a reality. So he tells China to meet him on this hill for a romantic night out, which just so happens to involve blowing up the moon. However, his thingamajiki isn't powerful enough to actually break it, so he pleads with her to just freaking kick it as hard as she can, which she does, and they succeed in rearranging the moon into a ring around the earth. All in the name of love. So yeah, this OVA was a trip. It had some great moments with some nice messages. You know, it's not the actual gift that matters, but the gesture itself. Sometimes little mistakes or imperfections can lead to major breakthroughs, etc, etc. It also had casual, incredulous lines like, A, you didn't know that the flower shop was also a parts black market? As well as the whole, you know, blow up the moon bit. Combine that with some casual sexual harassment as fan service, and it certainly wasn't a slam dunk in terms of quality. However, as I said, at its core, 
It's a nice sci-fi love story. And I love the storyteller presentation. That Kids is How I Met Your Mother, and created Earth's Ring in the process. Do you like long historical stories with lots of characters and interconnected political drama? Then this three-part film adaptation of Romance of Three Kingdoms might be the thing for you. I'll be frank, I was dreading watching this film. Dry, plot-based stories are basically the bane of my existence, and seeing the two-hour-plus runtime was no great motivator either. When I finally did watch it, I mean, yeah, it's kinda what I expected, but it does actually deliver things pretty solidly. While there's points where it seems clear that bits and pieces of the original epic are being abbreviated, enough is kept in where every character's actions and developments at the very least make sense. On a fundamental level, it's functional in pretty much every way. Solid production, good soundtrack, understandable characters, not too difficult to follow, even if there are some points I have to rewind and remember which character is which, but that's more a me problem than anything. However, at this point I must confess my grand sin to you dear viewers, I might have accidentally watched the second movie in the series. They're all similar lengths with similar titles, and though the kind of recap segment at the beginning makes a lot more sense with that context, honestly it didn't seem too odd of an introduction, and I have no familiarity with the original story, so... yeah, sorry. I think the appeal is pretty obvious, and if this is the kind of thing you're interested in, you probably knew after the first sentence of this segment. Myself, I can't bring myself to waste another two plus hours of my life bored to tears. Again, not bad. I'm not saying it's bad. Everything works. Still, not my thing. To get invested in this type of story, I need top tier direction, presentation, writing. Everything has to be the best it can possibly be. Not just fine. So, if you're interested in the tale of one man's quest to unify China under a three-ruler system, through which many strategies, friendships, battles, and betrayals are explored, then check it out. I'm gonna save myself the two hours and use it on something much more productive, like watching VTubers. <laughs> what the fuck? Why would you animate it like that? Clamp is a group that I've always had a cursory interest in, and while I often prefer their sci-fi stories over their fantasy ones, their name alone was enough to get me to try Rig Veda. The premise is pretty standard, evil guy overthrows good king, but a prophecy foretells that a select group of chosen heroes will overthrow him, with the former king's daughter, Ashra, being at the center of that group. And so our band of heroes travel about this fantasy world, searching for a way to make this prophecy come true. The story is also based on a classic Indian saga, hence the name being a reference to one of Hinduism's sacred texts. At first glance, this seems like something that'd be right up Clamp's alley, considering their penchant for heavy mysticism elements and extensive world building, which Rig Veda at least attempts to have in its opening scene. Unfortunately, the story falls apart immediately because this is one of those OVAs that just gives you the premise and then immediately jumps to a point further along in the manga and doesn't even attempt to give proper character introductions. I was horribly confused about pretty much everything the entire time I was watching this, and at no point did I really feel like I understood what was going on. This ends up making the characters feel almost completely hollow and borderline nonsensical. At one point, Ashura goes sicko mode and incinerates a bunch of random guards, but because so much of the context surrounding her character was cut out, I had no idea why this was happening or whether it was supposed to be a big deal or not. There was a little bit of intrigue surrounding her relationship with her mother, but not enough to say that it was worthwhile. And the rest of the characters might as well be blocks of wood with different character archetypes written on them. The aesthetic of the series has a pretty standard 90s fantasy look and gives off that usual Clamp vibe, but most of the characters are much older than Clamp usually writes, so that was a bit refreshing. 
The animation, however, was honestly some of the worst I've ever seen. Aside from a few decent action cuts, most of this OVA is a load of hot ass. Janky character models, significant lack of convincing facial expressions, laughable walk cycles, pretty much every bad animation quirk you can think of is present in droves here. As for sound design, it's pretty unremarkable on the whole. You get the standard heavy synth OST that you hear a lot in works from this era, but most of it just feels like white noise, and the voice acting is just mediocre. There was one moment where I swear they used the THX deep note, and I absolutely lost my shit. I'll be honest, it was really hard to find anything good about this one. It's a classic case of just read the manga, and that's all I can say on the matter. So, you know the Tower of Babel, right? That big tower that God was like, Oh, can you stop doing that? And the human said, No. And he was like, Oh, okay, then I'm gonna make it fall down. And also, you speak different languages now, fuck you! It sounds like a... Swell dude, huh? Well, actually, it was a failed project by a crash-landed alien who wanted to reach his people and used his godlike status to take advantage of human labor. However, their inexperience with technology led to its inevitable downfall. He did still want to pass on the right to his advanced technology before he died, and so when one of his bloodline deemed worthy is born, then Babel II will rise. Babel Nisei looks pretty damn good visually, especially with its use of light. And, mmm, those glorious 2D cars. I don't even like actual cars, but 2D animated cars, man, they just, they just do it for me. It makes me a little horny. The character designs definitely have that 70s cheese to it as a 4 episode OVA adaptation of a long running 70s manga, but I think that's all part of the charm of it. Okay, so maybe it looks a little stupid sometimes, primarily with the MC, but there's also plenty of badass designs, so it kinda balances out. The story follows Koichi, who has this great power from his alien predecessor thrust upon him and uses it to fight against Yomi and his psychic allies, who aim to rule the world and create an ethno-state of psychics like themselves. Along the way he meets Juju, a member of Yomi's band that was taken in by him when she was in need, that struggles with where her conviction lies. I really do want to like this, but unfortunately it has a lot of issues. He is so powerful. Like, my god, this guy might as well be god. Just when you think he's done, he somehow pulls even more power out of his anus. The evil dude is so evil. Like, so evil. How did they ever trust him? Why can't we get some background? A huge point of dramatic thrust is actually an anime original character, which is weird because she seems essential to the story having any emotional arc whatsoever and still greatly lacks development. Koichi's assistants randomly pop up and disappear with little explanation. The psychist's desire for world domination is barely explored, only vaguely gesturing in the direction of discrimination. There's so much you could have gone into there. It feels like entire chunks of the story were cut, especially between episodes, ending up with choppy, abbreviated character arcs that are difficult to buy into. The OVA is almost entirely one action scene to the next. Shit looks cool as fuck, but couldn't you spend, like, a little more time on character development? In the end, it has some fun moments and plenty of annoying ones, but is still pretty cool overall. My main frustration comes from seeing the potential for something that could have been really spectacular, but wasn't quite delivered on. The 70s manga it adapts actually comes from the pen and mind of Mitsuteru Yokoyama, who is an incredibly interesting and influential figure. This man made the first mecha, what have you done lately? What have... what have I done lately? Creator of Tetsujin Nijuhachigo, Giant Robo, Mahotsukai Sally, what a legend. Babel Nisei itself had two other anime series, one from 1973 and the other 2001, as well as a spin-off manga that was released in 2010. I'd imagine it, along with Yokoyama's other works, had a lot of influence on what came after, though unfortunately English sources on the matter are rather sparse. Nonetheless, I do think it is worth some appreciation. Hain 
の少年パビルミセイ Yes, we are starting off with a dog fucking anime. <sighs> This anime follows the innocent, young, and vulnerable Tokorozawa Chika as she is continuously sexually harassed and eventually molested by her dog Rin Chin Chin. And yes, his name is a pun for penis in Japanese. This anime is a festering pile of garbage that lets the viewers know it's garbage right off the bat. Featuring lines within the first two minutes of Rin Chin Chin fantasizing how much he wants to fuck this little girl. That is all of Kenel Tokorozawa. No nuance, no subtlety, just dog. Fucking. Now I, Korewa Eden, am quite the connoisseur of garbage, so some would assume an anime this raunchy, politically incorrect, and just flat out a bestiality fanfiction would be right up my alley. However, the big problem with this anime, aside from looking like shit, being voice acted like shit, and making me feel like shit, is that it moves way too fucking slow. These bestiality jokes, by any other stretch of the imagination, might be raunchy enough to be funny, but they spend so much time building up the same joke over and over. Over again, just for it to end in some shitty slapstick comedy. It is bad, and it just won't stop. Please, please make it stop. <laughs> But just when you think it's over, you're free and you're with your loved ones as as they protect you from the monster you just witnessed. Just like the anime rapes this poor little girl, it actually rapes you. It pulls you right back in. Yes, that's right. The after credit scene actually features the voice actor for Rin Chin Chin himself crawling around in a fur suit, pretending to take a piss, and subsequently. Consequently, pretending to be mentally ill while answering questions. Ah,、uh, it's shit. It's a it's a real unrelenting pile of shit. Why would you do this to me, Core? Why did I have to watch while my eyes cannot see? Two out of ten. Kids, robots, and good versus evil. This one's a fun, straightforward children's mecha show following the bestowal of bots onto this group of kids. They must keep the demon lord from being awakened and are faced with a curse from one of his servants that if their identities are revealed, they'll turn into dogs. It's got a cool style, and the animation has a lot of personality to it. The dad actually gets turned into a dog early on, and it seems like he is just gonna be a dog until they beat the baddie. Guess he really is in the doghouse, huh? <laughs> It has a fun, childish vibe, but it is basically exactly what you think it's gonna be, and there's nothing in particular that stood out to me and made me want to watch much more than I did. Perfectly serviceable for what it is, but there's other shows of its kind that have a bit more emotional appeal. Genesis Survivor Gaia Earth is not very good. It's a three-episode sci-fi action OVA directed by four different directors and produced by anime production studios AIC and Artmic. The latter of which went defunct a few years later and was absorbed by AIC. A total coincidence, I'm sure. Episode one had two directors, Shinji Aramaki and Hiroyuki Kitazume. The former of which is today known for CG affairs such as the Captain Harlock movie and that Ultraman Netflix series, while the latter is much less prolific, having mostly done some animation direction work for Gundam over the years. The directors of episodes two and three, Masayuki Ozeki and Hideako Oba, respectively, have certainly gotten around. Though between the two, it looks like Oba's been a lot busier since. The point here being that none of these guys were inexperienced or anything, and yet despite their talent, a good time was not delivered in this OVA. So what went wrong here? Well, a lot. Honestly, the inverse question would be quicker to answer. So let's do that. What went right? Precisely one thing and one thing alone. During my viewing of Genesis Survivor Gaiarth. I noted exactly one cut of animation that made me say out loud, and I quote, "Sick." I shall now play for you that clip. <laughs> There, pretty cool, right? 
Well, now that you've seen that, you don't have to watch any of the rest. No thanks necessary, just doing my job. So that's weird, right? For an action OVA to have only one noteworthy cut of animation, that's a big red flag right there. After all, what's an action show left with if its action sucks? Not a whole lot in this case. To be clear, the animation of the rest of the OVA isn't wholly awful. There are occasional sparks of life, but they're too few and far between, and too brief when they appear to leave much of an impact. That one clips all you're getting. With the action moot, the only other presentation element worth noting is the very mixed soundtrack, which can range from head-banging 90s rock to, uh... <laughs> Yeah. In other words, like the show it plays over the soundtrack is nothing to write home about. And unfortunately, I can't go without mentioning this OVA's many narrative shortcomings. Aside from the incomprehensible lore, what irked me the most was the abysmal character writing. This OVA's inability to create any sort of emotional connection between us viewers and the characters, or indeed between the characters themselves. I suppose you want some context, huh? So. The show opens with our pro tag Ital attending to his teacher slash father, uh, 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 Randis. Not a good sign when I have to look that up and I just watched the thing. But before we have any time to get acquainted with them or the setting, suddenly a bunch of bad guys who are called, and I'm not making this up, Republicans show up, torch the place, and kill Randis. This takes less than eight minutes. So already this thing is moving way too fast for us to make any meaningful connection to, well, anything. And this is a fairly standard revenge setup to begin with, but it could still be fine as long as the rest of the OVA makes some attempt to grapple with the emotional fallout this event would have on Ital, and you've already guessed that it doesn't do that. For the rest of the OVA, Ital just acts fairly happy-go-lucky and unfazed by the whole ordeal, which is pretty strange considering that you know, his goddamn father was violently murdered right in front of his face. I have a hard time believing in a protagonist when the show can't be bothered to spend any time exploring his emotional trauma. The rest of the cast doesn't get off much better. There's the female protagonist, Sahari, who has, and I counted, exactly three functions. One, get held hostage or otherwise thrown in danger so that Ital has to save her. Two, act jealous and like a brat to such an irrational degree that she ceases to be anything other than a caricature. Three, have a forced romance with Ital despite having absolutely zero chemistry with him. If all of that sounds absolutely terrible, congratulations, you have functioning brain matter. And then the other cast members... Uh... If I'm really stretching, the most interesting bit of writing in this OVA is hidden in the depths of episode 2, which can almost be said to maybe lightly tackle robot racism, but again, that's really stretching it. And of course, the show doesn't really do anything with this concept. So, in short, show bad, don't watch. Floral magician Mary Bell follows the hundreds of thousands of years old magical child as she's beckoned to the human world by Ken and Yuri's cry for help at the failing business of their parents' flower shop. From there, episodic events unfolding that usually involve some combination of magic, flowers, and Mary Bell herself. It's a cute childish show that's pretty easy to just soak in, and after six episodes I could have seen myself finishing it without much trouble. However, it doesn't quite hit the angle I personally am looking for, primarily because of two issues. A big part of Childish Maho Shoujo for me is the comfy vibe they craft, and the music plays a really big role in that angle. Could you imagine Sailor Moon or Cardcaptor without their iconic OSTs? Some are a big hit or miss for me, while others are consistently fantastic, but Mary Bell is outright annoying musically to the extent that it actually makes it hard to enjoy the experience. <laughs> 
While that partially holds me back from losing myself in the setting, the setup is also lacking in any particular profundity. Like for example, in episode 4 there's this very old tree that a lot of people have a strong connection to, tying together the old and young. It's an iconic landmark in the memories of the whole town, but it's going to be cut down because, according to the old codger, the tree is dead and a risk to others with the potential for falling branches. It kind of reminded me of the big oak tree I used to have in front of my house as a kid. I remember when they had to cut it down for that very reason, and it was genuinely a sad experience for me at the time. Especially when you're younger, your entire world feels so static and comfortable, that even the smallest of changes feel drastic and shocking. I had a lot of fond memories connected to it, I still distinctly remember it even now, the playtime and youth it embodied, the many occasions I try and fail to climb it. So at that age, seeing it reduced to but a humble stump and later on replanted with an entirely new tree was a strange experience, to say the least. I feel like you could use that kind of setup to say something meaningful about moving on, or memories and connections, you know, touch on something genuine there. But instead, they just magic the problem away. It turns out the tree was actually sleeping, or something like that. And unlike this tree, I guess, it feels totally hollow. While it's a little more subtle than I'm making it out to be, it's still emblematic of the emotional nuance I usually look for in this type of show and that I'm not really getting here. Magic just kinda solves all their problems, but it doesn't have the emotional resonance to it that I find in all of my favorite Maho Shoujo series. It's definitely easy enough to watch, and if you're looking for a sweet show with solid production, I'd recommend it. But next to similar series that have a little more to them, it's not exactly at the top of my list. Long-running comedies often get much less attention than seasonal shows or long-running shonen action series, but are still nonetheless a staple of the anime industry. And Crayon Shinchan certainly seems like one of the most interesting of the bunch. Our titular main character, Shinchan, is a five-year-old boy who I can only describe as the biggest little shit on the planet. And the infuriating defiance and sinister cleverness he displays in his everyday life lead him and those around him into a never-ending series of comedic hijinks, and that's pretty much the sole appeal of the show so far. I should note that this is still an ongoing series and has well over a thousand episodes at this point, so I only managed to watch a few from the beginning, but that beginning was enough to get me hooked and give me an idea of what the series is like, because boy does this show come out swinging. The very first joke has Shinchan drawing an elephant around his dick so that it looks like a trunk, and any show that leads with a joke like that and executes it as well as Shinchan does immediately has my attention. That said, while dirty humor is a core component of Shinchan's writing, it's not the only component. A lot of the jokes are more centered around Shinchan's relationship with his family and friends, and the absolutely infuriating situations he creates as a result of those relationships. Thus far, his mother has been one of my favorite characters, as she desperately tries to get this insidious little demon to just behave so she doesn't have to pull her hair out every five seconds as I laugh along to her suffering. Shinchan himself rides a fine line between acting like a real child and acting like an adult, which allows him to perfectly fit into the series and keep the comedy in a vague area between grounded and hyper-exaggerated, and I can't think of a single joke that's fallen flat so far. A lot of this is also due to the strong comedic timing and editing. The speed at which jokes are delivered vary wildly across each situation, but the show has a strong enough grasp on it all to make sure the short moments don't fly by too quickly, and the long moments feel like they have purpose rather than just feeling dragged out. It's just good comedic writing through and through. I was also shocked by how much I liked the overall aesthetic. It doesn't have much to offer in terms of animation, at least not in these early episodes, but the color design is usually pretty solid and it occasionally busts out a shot that's just really nice to look at. The character designs might be a deal breaker for some people, but I think they match the tone and aesthetic of the show rather nicely, and they only come off as ugly when they're meant to be for comedic effect. I kinda expected to have more to say about this one considering its legacy, but from what I've seen so far it's just this simple, straightforward comedy, and that's totally fine because it executes that comedy solidly. So if that sounds like something you're looking for, then give Shinchan a shot. 
This movie is boring. That's the long and short, the wide and thin, whatever other fucking dimension analogy I can give you, it's boring. Another entry in the lengthy Doraemon franchise, this one follows their expedition into the Kingdom of Clouds, ultimately meeting and getting mixed up with occurrences regarding the Sky People with some light tones of environmentalism. Except the main thrust of the narrative doesn't even kick in until like 30 minutes into this 90 minute movie. It feels utterly aimless and endlessly obnoxious. Look, I know it's famous and all, there's definitely better installments, but this movie in particular is painfully slow with no drive or particular points of interest in the dialogue. Pointless magic fun would be fun if it was fun. I know I'm not giving the most in-depth description here, but I'd rather not waste too much time on this one. Video Girl I was this endeavor's pleasant little surprise that really drew me for a stir of emotions through its roller coaster of a story. At the start, I found myself hating it, but slowly warming up to it over time. And now, after finishing the anime and writing this very script you are listening to, I just can't help but find myself reminiscing with nothing but positive thoughts. I look back with fondness to this story and nothing but love for these stupid little characters. Late 80s, early 90s Japan, you know the shits. Payphones, VHS tapes, huge CRT TVs, and all sorts of things to immediately make this an especially romantic viewing experience from a retroactive angle. This anime mainly follows aged up Gon, or as others may call him, Yota Moteuchi. Yota is a nice guy, keep that in mind. No, no, a real nice guy. Because of this, the man's been really down on his luck and nearing the age of adulthood has still never been on a date. We initially find him in his most sweatiest state watching a VHS tape with a girl named Ai being what can basically be considered a comfort girl after his recent rejection from his crush. While watching the film, sparkling lights occur, electricity flies, and Ai comes flying through the screen. Uh, she jumps through the screen for reasons that don't really need explaining right now because it would make this segment way too long, but if you're really curious, just go ahead and watch the anime. Ai is now living in the real world with Yota, a woman he previously specifically picked out now in his possession, so to say. So at this point, the anime really could go a lot of ways. And looking back, Holy fuck, I'm just glad it didn't take the dog fucking route. Uh, the rest of the first episode kinda just goes like this. Slapstick comedy scene between Yota and I. Oh ho ho ho! Extremely emotional scene, depicting scenes that occurred prior towards the anime starting. Bombastically hilarious scene between Yota and I. Extremely emotional scene, depicting scenes that occurred prior towards the anime starting. Ugh. Uh, I hope you're okay with drastic tone shifts because the, the beginning of this anime, oh. Just as I was ready to move on to the rest of the anime with a slightly sour taste in my mouth, boom, baby, they hit you. We get this heartfelt scene with an entered song that just punches the right way. God, you love to see it. You see, Video Girl I very much so is like this throughout its entire runtime. It could be painfully generic in one instance, whether it be Takashi being a generic jock surrounded by 999 tropes and 999 bitches, or it could be the subtle masterpiece that portrays so many heartfelt themes, like the hedgehog dilemma with Ai and Toka, or the idea of having a sense of urgency in life with <laughs> This anime has a plentiful set of ups and downs, both in plot and in quality, but in reality, I do truthfully think that the good outweighs the bad in this unique little love story. There was a lot packed into this little six episode OVA. Spoiler alert, Yota fucking beats God at the end. So yeah, I'm not joking when I say a lot happens. But a part of this anime that I think specifically resonated with me was the idea of equality in a relationship. Video Girl I spends most of its time running around in circles in what could possibly be considered a little bit of a love triangle. He likes her, but in reality, he just doesn't know that he likes her and she likes him. But in reality, she doesn't really know that she likes him. Through all of the noise, through all of the nonsense created by these clashing romantic desires. One thing 
is made very clear. If one person begins to form an unhealthy obsession fantasizing about another person, all you're really doing is putting them on a pedestal that one, they won't feel like they can live up to, and two, you'll feel inevitably inferior to them. Glorification is unhealthy, and sometimes the person in front of you cheering you on all along the way towards that love you so desire really may be the one for you. Wait a second, this is just the plot to Toradora! 8 out of 10. Before Gurn Lagan, before Evangelion, before Pad Labor and Mazinger and Gundam, before all that was an anime and manga by the name of Tetsujin Nishachigo, or Gigantor. The series holding the grand title of Mecha's founder was birthed by mangaka Mitsuteru Yokoyama in 1956, with a live-action adaptation in 1960 and an anime in 1963, which ran for a whopping 97 episodes and also got a dub under the name Gigantor, which premiered in America the year following. The story follows Shotaro Kaneda, who is left with control of the titular robot after his father's death. The robot had been produced as a weapon of World War II, but following Japan's surrender was left unused, and now Shotaro must keep the powerful weapon out of the hands of the baddies and use its powers for good. The series was spawned in part from Yoyama's own wartime experiences. Now the extent and minutiae of influence that Tetsujin had is something worthy of its own video from someone far more experienced than I am with the genre, but I always find looking back at these pivotal works really interesting in and of itself. There's even a giant ass model of the robot in the city the series was set in, and damn, that looks sick. Can't wait to visit Japan. Whenever, you know, the world isn't literally on fire. The reason I went into all this for the 1992 series Tetsujin Nijihachigo FX, which now instead follows Shotaro's son as the protagonist, and that's most of what I have to say about it. I do find it cool how you can still really feel the 60s in it, but other than that there's nothing particularly stand out. Might not be my cup of tea, but I can always appreciate its past. And also some cool robots. At first, I was very hesitant to cover a show named Mama is a 4th Grader. It just sounds like something you should stay away from, I'm not crazy, right? Thankfully, this isn't the anime version of a TLC reality show, or at least there's a lot less overly dramatic music and cuts to reactions out of context. No, you pretty much get what's on the tin, but what's on the tin might not be apparent to some. Some of you might know that I'm currently attending nursing school, and a common question I get is, where do you want to work after you graduate? I often looked off into the distance and imagined myself running around a chaotic emergency room, or calmly handing the right tool at the right time during surgery. But this semester, I encountered an area I had never even entertained the thought of, but love nonetheless, labor and delivery. I was fortunate enough to witness a C-section firsthand and take care of some babies in the NICU. And I'll tell you what, it's hard to describe exactly what that feels like. In some respects, Mama is a fourth grader is able to capture some of that feeling utilizing its inventive premise to the fullest. I don't know how I did it, but I somehow managed to stumble across another show where a child has to take care of a baby from the future. The show amusingly begins with a very different version of 2007 than we're probably used to, one with futuristic machines able to conjure up food at regular intervals and magic holograms. But of course of all things, an errant lightning bolt manages to strike the rod casually attached to a family's building and sends an innocent baby to the past who is greeted by none other than her own mother, just 15 years younger. And all this time, baby Mirai, yes, original name I know, forgive her mom, she's nine, is just vibing. Thus begins our wacky shenanigans. Natsumi must do her best to keep the baby secret from her friends, parents, and nosy neighbor, all the while dealing with her annoying, aspiring mangaka aunt who just moved in after missing rent. She was supposed to go to London for her father's new job, but in a Home Alone turn of events, her delay of one day switched to indefinitely. She has a baby to take care of after all. However, she must be mindful not to do anything that may affect the future. While the premise was initially a bit to wrap my head around, I have to say I'm having a great time with Mama as a fourth grader. Showing a bit of the future gives the show a bit of a Grecian tragedy-esque feel, establishing this happy fate for Natsumi and making us ask, well, how does she get there? 
If I had to describe the show in one word, and frankly what taking care of a baby is like in general, it would be frantic. You have to constantly be on the lookout for any potential problem, and any slight lapse of attention can lead to disastrous results. And on top of normal taking care of baby duties, Natsumi has her own childhood to live through. I haven't finished the show quite yet, there are a total of 51 episodes, but the first three episodes offer a very clear and enticing picture of what to expect. There's something incredibly endearing about watching someone who's in over their head try their hardest regardless. It's almost the opposite of Schadenfreude. I guess that'd be Moe if you think about it. Natsumi is established as a cheerful, energetic fourth grader who brightens up the room and befriends most people she meets. It's clear that there's no better fourth grader this responsibility could have been entrusted to. In addition to characterizing Natsumi incredibly well, these first episodes also establish a number of threads to be unwoven throughout the runtime of the show. The nosy neighbor who swears the annoying kid and her aunt next door are hiding something. The stupid but clever boy in Natsumi's class she would never think about ending up with. And finally, the stubborn cranky aunt who gets roped up in all this baby stuff. Meanwhile, they keep getting garbled messages from the future, who are frantically working on a solution to bring Mirai back to the Mirai. Frankly, this is the kind of stuff I love watching. The shenanigans of a couple of well-meaning characters dropped into the oddest of predicaments and making the best of it. It's a show as old as I am, but holds up tremendously against modern offerings. I'd love it if I could convince at least some of you to join me in saying, Gambatte Natsumi! So next up we have Sailor Moon, and... How the hell am I supposed to say anything about Sailor Moon? An absolute icon of the 90s, there's a good reason why it's such an immediately recognizable franchise, and to attempt to summarize it in but a few minutes would be doing it a great disservice. What am I supposed to do? Just say it's good? Cause it is. It's good. Great aesthetic, fun characters that play off each other well, god-tier soundtrack, plenty of more emotional moments alongside the lighthearted ones, it's good. I could just as easily watch one episode daily, weekly, or heck a dozen in a day, as the pleasing atmosphere created by its top tier production weaves a world that is endlessly enjoyable to take in. The whole cast has well established one on one dynamics as well as blending together as a group excellently, and while on a base level are essentially what is now tried and true formulas for an ensemble cast characterization, there's little subtleties that keep them standing out even today. Usagi's a general crybaby and scaredy cat, but ultimately an important catalyst as the most outgoing and friendly, helping open others up and bringing them all together, that being a uniting trait essential to a team leader. And with that is her more serious side, which comes out during the fights and when it's something really important to her, like her younger brother. The way she spouts off her cheesy lines has a little element of dorkiness to it that I really enjoy. It feels in character, even though she's playing up this heroic persona. Her endless banner with the fiery ray and the mysterious Mamoru make for a lot of the comedy. Mamoru's insults always bring a smile to my face, even more amusing with the rare occasions Usagi can send it right back at him. They all play off of each other in a way that makes for endless fun, the kind of cast that you could, if you wanted, just put them in a room and let the interactions come simply out of that, not any extraneous plot element. There's so many great quotables in the dialogue, I love them all. Since we're just kind of rapid firing this, another element I really enjoy about Sailor Moon's first season is how, surprisingly, some of the most emotional moments come from the villains. Though I guess at this rate it's closing in on two decades, I still won't spoil, but it seems like they perhaps had the ability to go a bit farther and darker with the villains, thus leading to some genuinely tragic moments. While the queen herself that leads the charge to collect energy with which to raise their dark leader is more directly evil, the subordinates are incredibly human. If the sailor senshi represents selflessness and virtue, then the villains are pride and selfishness. 
Despite them acting as part of a greater whole, they often intentionally act alone in cases where it is less beneficial, because they are driven more by their personal desires. Which I think is an interesting way to handicap characters that, if unified, would have likely been able to take down the protagonist for once and for all. It also is the source of my favorite arc in the first season, in which one of the villains is astounded by the human power of love when one of Usagi's friends unwittingly falls for his human alter ego, and as a result slowly finds himself changing bit by bit, acting in ways that would have previously been absolutely unthinkable. I'm in love with the pure style bleeding through the show, the designs, poses, outfits, hair, and I have to appreciate a show that's male and female cast are all equally attractive. I'm right there with Usagi, I'll swoon over Tuxedo Mask any day of the week. The first season was directed by Junichi Sato, who has worked on a lot of my favorites, and it seems like every time I watch something new that he's worked on, I absolutely adore it. I wouldn't say he's as over-the-top in style, or has as clear tells as a lot of recognized directors like Oshi or Anno, but there's a clear attention to detail. Little subtleties paired with a sense of space and setting that bleeds through all of his work that I've consumed. Even with the show having some weak moments animation-wise, its strong direction carries it. The pacing and composition of each scene, the excellent color design, which might be my favorite element of its production, the effects and sounds, little touches like how this episode has a piano piece playing on the radio that was written by a famous pianist we learn about in an earlier episode when Usagi helps him, or great little cuts like this one, Everything comes together as a whole well, crafting a show that is, to put it simply, fun to watch. Episode 21 highlights an animation studio as what is clearly a fun little nod to themselves, the studio producing an in-world show that is very similar to Sailor Moon, closing out with this line. <laughs> And I think they definitely succeeded. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. Let me know in the comments what your favorite segment was or what your favorite moments or any interesting insights you might have about some of the stuff we talked about. I love hearing you guys' thoughts. That's a big part of what makes these kind of videos fun, getting a dialogue going about anime that not a whole lot of people are still talking about. Also, please check out my guests, they're linked in the pinned comment and the description. I think they all brought their own little unique touch to the video and I'm really happy that I could have them on. I also have a Patreon if you want to support what I do. A uh, special thank you to my lovely patrons listed here. I would like to do some importing of like obscure VHSs and stuff and maybe rip some things that I can't find online, but not super financially viable right now, so perhaps something for the future. Also, follow me on Twitch at twitch.tv slash course name is too short. I stream quite often, doing all sorts of cool things. Please follow me. Uh, please. Thanks again for watching, and I will see you, hopefully, in the next one. See you later. Oh my god, amazing, thank you.